relative newcomers like West Nile virus. Mom and his students and collaborators are in the middle of this battleground. Getting a handle on the ecology of infectious diseases is complicated for many reasons. One of them is that many variables are involved. There are the vectors, the hosts, the mode of transition, transmission, the habitat change, climate change, the life history of the vector, as well as the host, and more and more and more. One thing is clear, as Professor Kilpatrick said in an earlier paper, the continued introduction of pathogens to new regions is inevitable in our globally connected planet. He collaborates with many colleagues here and elsewhere. He has raised ample money for his research, as he should. He has published in prestigious journals such as Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and so forth. He has advised many students, and they have gone on to obtain excellent positions. The title of his talk today is Mosquitoes, Birds, Bats, and Diseases, Ecological Insights to Benefit Public Health and Conservation. Thank you very much for that introduction, Bernie, and thank you guys all for coming today. I'd like to start by just acknowledging that all the work I'll be talking about today was not done by myself, but by a substantial team of people. Um, and in particular, I'd like to point out my former graduate students in the pictures below that performed a bunch of the research on the bats that I'll discuss, as well as some colleagues who worked on the mosquito project. So, I want to give away the punchline for my talk today and tell you that there are going to be three stories, and each of those stories is going to have a major take home point. And the first point is that climate isn't the only thing that's changing. Lots of other things are changing in the world around us. And it's good to keep in mind those other things. And a thing that we want to keep in mind are land use change and changing the chemical, the chemical environment around us. Second, if you're a biologist or even just a person that enjoys the outdoors or enjoys nature, you'll frequently find there's these puzzles where you go out in nature and organisms are missing from places you think they should be. And so I call these natural history mysteries. And I'll try to give you a story about what those gaps in the distribution of organisms might reflect, that they actually might actually reflect the ghost of species interactions past. That is, species interactions that basically create these gaps in distributions or abundance. And then finally, uh, the topic that is uh, really going to be quite uh, close to home, we might ask, how do these pathogens that Bernie eloquently described get from one host to the next? You might think, well, primarily we're going to get these pathogens being spread from person to person via our close social connections that we know very well. But in fact, I'll show you that quite frequently, pathogens can jump from social group to social group via infrequent and indirect connections. And so in a very kind of trivial way of saying that, if you're the Starbucks barista, this person that you have these very infrequent chance interactions with, but can play a crucial role in linking to social groups. Okay, so the first one of these stories is addressing a question that I'm sure all of you have seen because it's in the news all the time, and it is, how will climate change affect disease, and specifically, how will climate change affect vector-borne diseases? Um, so there's been all kinds of headlines all over the place. We're all well, well aware that the climate is changing globally, and we want to know how is that going to affect vector-borne diseases? Is it going to be more disease, less disease? In what place will there be more disease, and so on? So the first part, I'm going to try to address that by asking, how has climate and climate change affected mosquitoes over the last hundred years? And so one might kind of just intuitively think, the answer is, well, surely we have more mosquitoes around us because it's a warmer, wetter world, right? So to try to address this question with data, not simply kind of by intuition, we went and gathered a bunch of data. So um, via some colleagues that I mentioned earlier in the second slide, we were able to get mosquito abundance data for three different counties that span the US, so New York, New Jersey, and California. Um, and we were able to get data for almost 50 different mosquito species across almost 100 years, so a huge kind of temporal scale. And then we asked, what drives fluctuations in the numbers of mosquitoes of these different species across space and time? And we really wanted to try to pull out the effect of climate and climate change because that's a topic, obviously, of enormous interest. So we looked at all kinds of temperature variables. We looked at things like 
the average temperature across an entire year, the kind of winter severity, summer, fall, you know, which different seasons might affect the mosquitoes, and so on. Um, we also ask, uh, measure different ways of measuring precipitation, because of course you guys know mosquito larvae breed in water. And so we did the same thing trying to get all the different rainfall variables, and trying to see what is the effect of climate on mosquitoes over the past century. So I'll jump right into some of the patterns, and we can try to see if we can sort this out. So this is data from a county in New York, Suffolk County, and over um, the last kind of 60 years, here's data actually showing for the last 40 years or so, there's been about a five-fold increase on average across all the mosquito species in this county um, over the last 40 years or so. So you say, wow, okay, there's been this big rise, about five-fold more mosquitoes. You can say, what's that caused by? So on this graph, the black symbols are the mosquitoes, the red symbol is temperature, and the kind of, uh, I don't know, blue-green cyan color, that's rainfall, precipitation. And so what hopefully your eye can see, because it looks like a relatively simple story, is that kind of if you put the best fit line through these graphs, the mosquitoes have gone up about five-fold, at the same time that it's gotten a bit warmer and a bit wet, right? So it seems like a great simple story, but then we might say, wait a second, was something else also happening during the same period? So there's been some climate change for sure, but there's other things also changed besides the climate. And also, what happened before that? So I just showed you data here from about 1965 onward, but of course it turns out we have data actually from before that. So let me show you that. And I'll say this is actually the mosquito abundance state in this county of New York over the last 80 years, so since the 1930s. And you see this totally different pattern, right? Instead of having a simple linear increase over the last five decades, we have this huge amount of mosquitoes. They crash down in very low numbers, and then they rise after that over the next five decades. And so um, I might say, okay, what interesting thing is happening here in this kind of gray box? What happens to make mosquitoes go from super, super high abundance to crash to be very, very low for almost a 20 year period and then slowly rise afterwards? <laughs> All right, so many of you in the audience might have a hunch about this, right? In fact, that's the period of peak DDT use, right? And so that's actually very strong evidence that that causes this enormous crash in the mosquitoes there. So that makes sense, except that we stopped using DDT in the mid to late 60s. So why do the mosquitoes, you know, they reproduce every couple weeks? Why didn't they bounce back really fast after that? So these are kind of some of the ongoing questions. And here's one partial answer for that. So if you actually measure the concentration of DDT in the soil, that's what's shown by the blue line here, sure it peaks when we're using tons and tons of DDT, but even though we stop quite abruptly in the uh, early to mid 60s, depending on where you were in the US, the concentration in the soil remains there for the next 40 years. And so in fact, even into the very early 2000s, you can still find DDT in uh, soil cores in lakes and sediment all across the US, and that's where the state is from. So there was this persistent signal of DDT still out there, even though we hadn't used it in the last 40 years. Okay, so that's DDT, but of course other things have also changed over the last 80 years as well, and one of those things is the kind of number of people on the planet and the land use associated with urbanization. And so if we just plot the number of people in the same county over that time period, that's what's shown by this green line here. And you can see it's gone up enormously, it's actually increased about fivefold as well. So we've had this enormous change in the chemical environment, but we've also had a huge change in the land use itself. So if we kind of make the story as complicated as this it should be, <laughs> put the climate in there, the land use in there, the DDT, both use and kind of concentrations in the environment, and then ask, what the heck? What's going on here? What are the actual driving variables really responsible for affecting the mosquito populations? And so it turns out that the variables that we think might be involved are actually not highly correlated with each other, so it's actually not that difficult to separate out their individual impacts. That's what we've done statistically. So I'm going to give you one quick um, uh, uh, demonstration of that. So the black uh, symbols and, and line on this graph are the same mosquito populations I've shown you in all the graphs beforehand. And now we've tried to fit models to that data that either include all the climate variables we wanted to put in, or all the climate variables and DDT. And the fundamental thing that we get is that the blue line, which is the kind of dashed blue line that says model without DDT, that's the best fitting model we can possibly do with all the climate variables we have, but no DDT. And you can see it spikes along, it might explain a little bit of the mosquito abundance data, but it's not really a good fit at all. And that's because it's missing that crash. There is no climate signal at all that we can find that can explain this enormous crash in the mosquito populations. And we need the use of DDT and the concentration of DDT to give both the crash and the very slow recovery afterwards. None of the climate variables make that same pattern. So we can feel, feel pretty confident that the only way to explain the pattern of mosquito change over this past 80 year period is the combination of DDT use and DDT concentration in the environment. And it turned out the temperature and the rainfall had a much more minor effect than these uh, chemical signatures. 
So DDT was actually much, much more important than climate was in this overall process. So, um, so that's the take home from that part. So that was just one county in New York. Go ahead. Before I go on, how about birds and the feed mosquitoes? Because the population is changing also. Yes. So there are lots of other things in the environment that also could affect mosquitoes. Um, and uh, most of those things that I'm aware of, we do not have data that span back that same period. So it's hard for us to really pull those things out. And I will say that um, the model with DDT still has, fits the data moderately well, but still has fluctuations around that. And the additional variation that's not explained is probably due to things like you're talking about. So if you look at the red line, which is the model, best the model with DDT in it, it follows the path of the black numbers pretty well, but not perfectly. There's definitely additional variation explained by mosquito predators and things like that. Absolutely. Okay, so that was just, I did, showed you data so far from New York. And of course, that's one small place. What about somewhere else? Are the patterns the same? What does it look like? In addition, that was data just for mosquito abundance, kind of averaged across all the mosquitoes. What about the numbers of mosquitoes that are in a given place? How many mosquito species are there? So here's a, a, a slide that I'm going to walk you through kind of step by step. And so it basically shows on the right mosquito abundance patterns in New York, New Jersey, and California. And the left side is mosquito species richness, so the number of mosquito species in this county. And again, the same three states over the last 80 years or so. So I'm going to kind of step you guys through this. And so this first graph is the graph I've already shown you so far. So it basically shows in black the mosquito populations being very high, crashing, and then slowly recovering over a 40 or 50 year period. That's what I just showed you a minute ago. If you look at happen and ask what happened in New Jersey, the answer is similar, although there's a little bit more fluctuations early on, but they also basically were high in the early 30s and 40s, then crashed when DDT use was high. And then recovered afterwards, but a little bit faster than they did in Suffolk County, New York. And if you want, we can talk afterwards about the possible differences between those two places. But one, poss one strong possibility is uh, just that the environments in Suffolk County, New York, are basically more isolated than the rest of the environment. So that's one possibility. California, which is where we are, of course, um, the patterns there are a little bit different and kind of interesting. And so the mosquito buttons, which is shown in, in black, the black symbols and the um, red dashed lines, just kind of a character, caricature of that pattern to make it a little easier to see. Basically, mosquitoes also crash when DDT use occurs and the concentration goes up. They recover afterwards, but they recover much faster than they did in the other two places. And then strangely and interestingly to me, then slowly decline over time afterwards. So clearly something very different is happening there than in New York and New Jersey. And I think it's actually, we can talk later about the possibilities that are happening there, but I think that's quite interesting. So that's the abundance of mosquitoes. We can then turn to how many mosquito species are in the given place. And in New York, which is the top graph, the pattern is very similar to mosquito abundance, just that there were lots of mosquito species there, they crashed when DDT use got high, and they recovered afterwards. So that's a relatively simple story that's like we said a minute ago. In New Jersey, it's interesting, they also crash when DDT use spikes up and concentrations get high, then they recover afterwards, but then something interesting happens, they actually go to a higher level than they ever were before DDT use. So somehow they're actually able to kind of do even better than before that. So that's quite interesting. And then finally in California, we get the same crash and this recovery afterwards. And then just like the abundance patterns, we actually get this slow kind of decline in mosquito species in California in these two counties over time after that. So there's basically some interesting stuff happening with DDT, but some other things happening as well. And I think it's a combination of things that I'm trying to emphasize here. But there's a couple of big strong patterns and some additional patterns overlaid on top of that. So in conclusion here, across these three different regions, New York, New Jersey, and California, where we were able to get our hands on data spanning five to eight decades. And that kind of lengthy data is what's needed to answer these kind of long-term questions. We found that for both mosquito abundance, so how many mosquitoes there are in a place, and the different numbers of species that are there, which we call mosquito species richness, DT use and concentration in the environment were really, really dominant factors affecting those uh, variables. So if you want to know how many mosquitoes are in a given place, or how many mosquito species will be there, across this eight decade period, the strongest predictor was DDT use and DDT concentration in the environment. So were we spraying it actively, and what was the concentration, residual concentration in the environment? Those are the dominant things. In addition to that effect, there were additional effects um, of land use or urbanization in the environment, as well as precipitation. Super surprisingly to us, there was not really a strong influence of temperature. So even though we know, if you look at the temperature data, it's changed in, this, in all these three counties, it's gone up a little over a degree Celsius, and we've definitely seen climate change there, the effect of that on the mosquitoes is much, much smaller than these other effects. So that's not to say there isn't climate change, it's not to say that climate change doesn't matter, it's just to say that there are other stuff too we really also need to worry about. And that's the really, really important thing that I wanted to give you guys as a take home from this section.
There's, no, there's other stuff going on there. Okay, so the conclusion from this first part is that climate change is definitely occurring, but lots of other things are also changing. Sometimes these other things, in this case chemical use, but also land use, um, and lots of other ecosystems, there's new species being introduced, those have huge impacts on ecosystems. Um, there's sometimes kind of changes in, in the land use that's there. Sometimes those things will actually be even more important than climate change. So we should worry about climate change, but not just climate change. That's the major take-home message from this first part here. And from a kind of slightly taking a step back in a scientific perspective, if we test a single hypothesis, like is the planet warming, and what's the effect of that warming, and ignore everything else, we can sometimes get a pattern that's suggested to us, but turns out to be wrong. So we should be a little bit careful when we do science just with a single idea in mind. We should try to embrace multiple ideas at one time. Okay, so that's the first section. So the second uh, story I'm going to try to tell you guys today is about these things that I call natural history mysteries. So if you guys, how many of you guys are into either birds or plants or butterflies or any sort of natural organisms? Raise your hand. Okay, great. So at least half of you and probably the rest of you at least to some extent. If you say, hey, this place here looks like a great place for redwood trees. Why aren't there redwood trees around me here? Well, this place looks like a great place for this species of bird that I really like, and yet I don't see any of them here. So trying to understand what is what are the factors that basically give rise to the patterns of distribution of organisms or to make them more or less abundant, those are the kind of mysteries I'm talking about. So if you plot distributions of organisms, and I've given you a couple examples here, in the lower left is the graph of where we find a species of bat called the northern long-eared bat. It's found in the eastern US, and this little arm that extends up into western Canada with this big hole in it. That's really weird. So what's causing that pattern? So that's what this is about here. So sometimes the answers are relatively easy. So sometimes we can make maps and find out that the distribution of a species basically extends up to some kind of temperature limit, and above that it just simply seems to be too cold. So that's a nice kind of clean, simple story that works out sometimes. Sometimes the organism has a dominant food item it eats, and if that food item is not there, it's not there. And that's pretty easy too, right? So if your food source is not there, you can't be there. So that's great. Other things that are much harder to actually kind of uh, observe directly are when there are kind of species interactions, meaning things that eat you, if they're present or not present, that might determine whether or not you can be there. And so um, that's harder to kind of see directly sometimes, seeing kind of predation in action. There's a few places in the world you can kind of do that easily, including the Great Migration we were just heard a minute ago about where Barry Bowman is today. Um, but lots of the times it's quite hard to see predation in action. And so these kind of species interactions are hard to observe, and therefore we can sometimes see these mysteries and not really know what's happening, and the real answer is that there's actually interactions that are explaining those things. So I'm going to give you examples of that today. So the question is, how can we actually observe these kind of invisible species interactions? And one way is by the introduction of new species. So this is a graph here from a paper that basically just shows the connections by airplane flights among cities all over the world. And I don't think I have to tell you guys that the world is an amazingly connected place now. And the result of us shipping people and planes and goods all around the world at extremely high paces is that new things get introduced all the time. And these new introduction zones can give us insight into how species interactions work. So one example I'm going to talk about today is the introduction of a fungus um, that infects bats. And so this fungus causes a disease which we call white nose syndrome. That's because it makes bats, basically grows on bats' faces as well as their other parts of their skin and makes them have big white noses or white muscles. So that fungus was first observed in New York, here where that red arrow is, um, kind of southeastern New York, in 2006, 2007, and over the next decade, spread across the entire country. And in fact, reached the west coast um, and this map in 2017, 2018, actually the year before that, I'm sorry, 2016, 17. And then actually it's now in California. As of just a couple months ago, there was an announcement that this fungus has now reached California bats as well. So this fungus is kind of spread across the country. In doing so, it's been not so great for bats. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, oh, I took that one slide out. Okay, so, um, so this fungus, uh, I'll say a couple things about it. Oh yeah, I guess I'll show you a later slide. This fungus is actually present throughout Eurasia. So um, actually my students, former graduate students who are now professors at, at Virginia Tech, uh, went over to um, Asia, China, Japan, Mongolia, all these places, as well as got a bunch of samples from Europe. And the fungus is actually widespread across that entire part of the old world. We think it was introduced um, probably from uh, somewhere in Asia, sorry, in, in Europe, but we don't know exactly where just yet. Um, the bats there seem to be doing much better than our bats here. Um, the disease has a very interesting um, seasonality to it, which is to say that the bats in summertime, when they're awake and not hibernating, seem to do just fine if they get the fungus on them. It doesn't even grow because their body temperature is warm like ours. But in the fall, when they go back to their caves and mines to hibernate, 
their body temperature, they actually let it fall to ambient temperatures. So I didn't really understand this until I started working on bats. But you guys know those laser thermometers you can use to measure the temperature of your oven. If you measure the temperature of the wall in a cave and it says like 3.2 Celsius, so just above freezing, if you hit the bat hibernating next to it, it'll say 3.2 Celsius. The bats are basically let their body temperature go all the way down to indis indistinguishable from the environment around them, which is pretty amazing. Wow. So that's amazing, except that also means that this fungus that actually grows quite well between about 2 degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius can now suddenly grow quite well on the bats themselves. So they basically get infected in fall and they start hibernating, the fungus grows then and then basically uh, invades their tissues and they're trying to sleep, trying to basically hibernate, and it basically makes them wake up too frequently and they burn through their fat reserves. So they're normally hibernating for a whole winter, just waking up every so often to, for an hour or two to do a few kind of normal bodily functions, and this fungus makes them wake up two or three times more frequently. So that's how it kills the bats. Okay. Um, so, uh, when this fungus invaded the northeastern part of the U.S., there were six different species of bats that hibernated in caves of mines together. And these are pictures of them up there. Um, and the most abundant bat that was there is called the little brown bat. And the lower graph just shows the fraction of each of these um, uh, caves or mines that had a bunch of bats, what fraction was each species. And what your eye can hopefully just see is that in these six different um, caves, just as examples, little brown bats are half to like two-thirds of all the bats. So they're quite abundant species. So, the impact of this disease on bats was really horrendous. So this graph here basically shows what was the population of these bats doing before this fungus got there, and what happened in the first year afterwards. So the blue lines across the top are the population, kind of change in population size on average per year in these six different species of bats before the fungus got there over about a decade. And so what you can see, and also will say, the dashed line at zero means a stable population. So all the blue lines are actually slightly above that, meaning the bats are actually doing slightly better. And a small aside, which we can get into later if you want, is you can ask, why are the bats growing before the fungus got there? Was that some mosquito DDT residual effects on insects that caused there to be more and more insects around that enable the bats to grow? We can talk about that later if you want. Anyway, the bats were doing great before this fungus got there. In the first year after the fungus gets to a site, that's what's shown by the red, um, the red bars here. And so you can see that the first two species decrease a bit, so on the order of about 25% decline in their abundance. Not good, but not terrible. But then these other th next three species, or actually the next four, all decline by an average of something between 40% and the northern lion bat, which is the fifth species on the bottom across to your right. That bat goes down about 99% in the first year after the fungus gets there. And in fact, I'll show you data later, they just keep going down after that. So really, really, really tank when this fungus gets there. So that's the first year effect, and you might ask, okay, what's the eventual impact of this disease going to be on these populations? Will it drive some species totally extinct? Will it knock them down with like to recover? And which species will be hit the hardest? And what are the traits of those species that affect the impacts of this disease on those bats? So that's um, the kind of questions that we tried to address after that. So the first big question from a kind of conservation perspective was, was will this disease, white nose syndrome, which I've abbreviated WNS, Will it drive some species extinct, and if so, which ones? And so, when I first started doing this work, I thought this might be the most exciting project I ever got to work on, because we could do some work in the first year or two after the fungus got to a place, make some predictions, identify the most important species to do something about, to conserve, and then try to actually stop extinctions from happening. And so, as Bernie actually talked about in his introduction, there are, we have know many other cases where a disease gets introduced to a new place, causes dozens and dozens of extinctions, and afterwards we're like, ah, that was too bad. And so here we're thinking, wow, can we just do something ahead of time and stop these extinctions? So that was the kind of goal of this research. So we ended up um, trying to say, okay, what can we do here prospectively? So take a little bit of data and then use that to make predictions in the, kind of in the future and then do something about those predictions. So, um, yeah, so that's what we're going to try to do here. So perspective approach we're going to use here is to use this first year decline data to try to make predictions afterwards. Um, and, and how can we actually know, based on just the first year decline, is a species likely to go extinct or not? And so the answer is we're going to use some disease ecology theory. So some of these things are going to be a little bit intuitive, I think. So uh, for many different diseases, the spread of the pathogen from person to person or host to host is what we'll call density dependent. And that means the higher the density of that population, the faster the spread occurs. And that's, I think, kind of intuitive. You can imagine, I think there's about 50 or 60 of us in the room here today. If I sneeze, many of you might get sick. If there are only four or five people in the room, less of you would get infected. So that's kind of the simple concept there. Um, it turns out that that's not always how things work. That there are circumstances in which sometimes um, animals, uh, organisms, basically have small social groups 
And that if there's 12 of us in the room or 50 of us in the room, we might all occur in groups of four anyways, so the transmission of the disease doesn't change it. Does that make sense? So, so this other possibility that where transmission is not density dependent, and in the literature, for reasons we won't go into, people have called that frequency dependent transmission, that's simply the case where disease spread does not increase with the density of that species. And so if that's the case, then as the species gets more and more abundant or more and more dense, transmission does not go up, and that changes how the spread actually occurs. In crucial, the crucial point here is that if transmission is density dependent, which is the first possibility, if you're a very abundant species, the disease kills a bunch of you, then as you get rarer and rarer, transmission gets less and less efficient, then you can stabilize at a lower level. Does that make sense? In contrast, if transmission is not density dependent, then if it kills half of you and you still form your same size groups, then it may keep spreading and actually kill all of you. So the prediction here basically is that if transmission is density dependent, then you'll decline, but as you decline, transmission gets less efficient, and therefore you'll stabilize at a low level and not go extinct. Whereas if transmission is not density dependent, then it can basically keep knocking you down all the way to extinction. So we can basically ask, what was the, how is transmission occurring in these different bat species, and which of these two do they follow, and therefore are they likely to go extinct or not? So that's what I'm going to do. So here's four species of bats that were the hardest hit by the fungus in that first slide I showed you a minute ago. And we can ask, what's their sociality? How do they interact with each other in groups? And can we then make predictions about how the disease will spread through their populations? So it turns out that two of these species, when they hibernate, they hibernate always by themselves. So if you go into a cave or a mine, which is um, where we do all of this work in the wintertime, where the bats are hibernating, these two species on the left, the northern long-eared bat, and we call this the tricolored bat, they are always found by themselves. They'll be roosting on the wall, not touching any other bats. They seem to be really, really antisocial. And so why is that? Well, we can go into those details later if you want, but that's basically the pattern that we see. In great contrast, the two species on the right, those pictures that you see, which you probably can't even recognize what's going on there, but that's literally just a mass of bats. So the upper picture there is called the Indiana bat, and they frequently uh, hibernate in clusters of up to thousands of bats. So you'll find a thousand bats all armed, armed, armed touching each other. And the lower picture is little brown bats that also form these quite large clusters. So that's the sociality of these bats during winter, which we would think would affect transmission of this disease. I should say one more thing, just to be clear. This fungus um, actually infects the skin of bats, a bit like athlete's foot, that kind of thing. And therefore, you can quite imagine that nuzzling up next to another bat is a good way to spread a, a skin disease. So contact in this way really matters quite a bit. Okay, so the predictions we would make is that these bats that um, roost individually by themselves the higher and higher densities there are, the higher chance one's going to bump into another bat, and therefore we think transmission should be density dependent. And that's what the DDT stand for here, different from the DDT part in the other part of this talk. <laughs> and the right part of this uh, slide here, the bats that are social, no matter how many bats there are in a cave, they're still going to form groups, and so transmission is not going to decline as their populations get lower and lower and lower. So that's the prediction here. So let's look at the data and see if those predictions are borne out. So what we basically did was we asked if we plot the population size on the x-axis, which is what's here on the log scale, and the y-axis, we actually ask how badly did that population do in the first year after the fungus got to a place? And the idea here is that if transmission is density dependent, those populations that were really big and dense should do terrible, those populations that were small and sparse should do not as bad. Does that make sense? That's the prediction, and that's basically what you see in the data for this bat, the northern long-eared bat, and that's that dashed, sorry, that solid black line. So the idea here is that the population growth, sorry, the population size or density is on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the population growth rate, and lower is worse. And so that um, red dashed line is a stable population, and sadly, what you can see for this population, all the populations are not stable, they're all declining, and the ones that are in the really big dense populations are doing the worst. So this population is, appears to be affected by a density dependent transmitted disease, and the good news, initially you would think, is that as they get rarer and rarer, the population, the disease will get less efficient, and they should stabilize. So we would think the extinction risk should be a little bit lower for this species. Um, yeah, so uh, if we look at the other uh, species here, so that's the first species, there's now uh, four species here. The two on the left, we predicted ahead of time they're not social and therefore should, transmission should be density dependent. They should do better when they're kind of rarer, sparser, because transmission will be less efficient. Whereas those populations where the, they're very, very social and occur in these groups, transmission is high no matter how many bats there are. And in those groups there, we actually simply see no evidence that the populations that are more dense do worse or better. So the two graphs on the right here, if you try to fit lines that are increasing or decreasing to that data, you find no evidence that the bats in the really dense populations are doing any better or worse than the ones in the sparse populations. The bad news is that that means if they start out really, really dense and decline, 
They still keep declining even when they get sparse, and that's the bad news. In contrast, the ones on the left, as they decline, the disease transmission gets less efficient, and they don't do as badly. So that's the kind of take home from here. And so, um, yeah, so that's that part. So one small detail I want to point out here, which is where the devil's in the details. So the species in the upper left, the northern long-eared bat, the, the less dense populations, the sparse ones, are getting closer to that dash red line, which is where they're stable and not declining. So that's good. So this, you could say that these guys are not going to go extinct, right? And the answer is, the problem here is that when that black line, which is the kind of predicted line that's fit through all of the data that we have, where does it intersect stability? What population size will those bats be at when the disease transmission gets so inefficient that they can stabilize there? The answer is about half of a bat. So it is the case that these bats do best in sparse populations, but the disease transmission is efficient enough that even when there's just a few bats left, it still gets from bat to bat, and they basically are going to get driven fully extinct. Does that make sense? So even though transmission is density dependent, it's not, uh, they still have too much interaction among these bats. Okay, so that was what happened. Those are our predictions that we were able to make in the first year after this fungus got to these sites. And we can say, who's going to go extinct? And actually, then we can actually follow for the next five years and say, what can we do? I should also say, as an aside, we were able to get these most threatened species um, listed in the, under the Endangered Species Act to try to actually do things to help the bats. So that was what we were able to do with this information. So we can kind of test these ideas. So the northern long-eared bat that I just showed you a minute ago, where we made this prediction that they should decline, they should do a little bit better at lower populations, but still go extinct because the transmission was still efficient enough. They basically declined by about a huge amount the first year, a huge amount the second year. There's only one population left the third and fourth years, and then everyone goes extinct. So in fact, this bat, everywhere this fungus has gotten to, within three to four years, the bats are completely wiped out. So that's a super, super kind of depressing story, and that's the way it's worked out. A second species of bat, where they also decline as they get smaller and smaller, the declines get less severe, They've actually stabilized, and it's actually quite great. So these bats are much more abundant, but they're not going extinct. They're still present, just at much, much lower abundances. So that's what's happening with the tricolored bat. Then we have two more species of bats. One is this very, very uh, social species that occurs in these very large clusters. The data suggests that as they decline, they still form these social groups, and therefore transmission keeps occurring, and they keep declining. So um, we don't have any evidence that these guys are stabilizing, which is not super good. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, there's another story that we'll talk about later. And then finally, this fourth species that also forms these groups, we thought would decline and keep declining as it got rarer and rarer. Um, but thankfully, they actually stabilize. So as you can see on the graph over here, the first two or three years, they're far below that zero line. But then the last two years, they're actually stable. Their population growth rates are basically at that stability line, and they're doing OK. And you say, hey, what the heck's going on? You said this species was a social species, and therefore the transmission should keep being very, very high. Well, it turns out two interesting things are happening. I don't have time to show you all the details, but one thing is that they became less social. So the species that used to roost, roost in big groups now roost almost entirely by themselves. So that's kind of crazy and interesting. And second, they um, a subset of the bats appear to be resistant to the fungus growing on them, and they're actually able to keep the fungus from growing to really high levels. So the combination of this change in sociality and an increase in resistance to this disease has enabled these populations to persist. Okay, so I want to do a small interlude and say, how is it that the solitary species of bats, meaning bats that roost completely by themselves all winter long, we thought, can get this disease to spread from bat to bat? So if they're never ever touching another bat, how can they get this, this fungus being spread from bat to bat? And so, um, more generally, we can ask, so this is a question about bats, which I'm going to show you data from these bats. But the question is really the general, and applies to people, and plants, and wildebeest, and every animal you can imagine. How do epi epidemics spread between social groups. So you have your, your people that you hang out with all the time, and you can easily imagine your family members, your best friends that you spend lots of time with, if you get a cold or a, the flu, of course you can easily spread to them because you're hanging out with them all the time. You're sharing airspace with them in a room like this, or in a car, or you're you know, talking to them closely, that kind of stuff. But people that you don't really know, you know, on the other side of the earth, how do we share pathogens with them? So that's the kind of fundamental question here. I will say that the dominant paradigm before we did this work was that primarily, Transmission did occur within these social groups. We thought also that there were sometimes connections among social groups. They may be one individual that might be part of this friend circle and also part of that friend circle, um, which you might have heard the term small world networks. Uh, things like that in physics describe that kind of phenomenon. But we do have this sometimes these cases where you get individuals that really don't seem to be connected to anyone, and yet somehow you think, okay, they should be safe from disease in this case. So this graph, right, what I'm showing you actually right here, is actually uh, represents a network of bats inside one of our sites. 
So this, in the lower left-hand corner, is actually a bunch of bats hibernating in a single group together. And then, um, and that's one species that's in the light blue, whereas the other colors represent other species. And you can ask, say, something like the um, red circles, which there's only a couple in this graph because this site only had a couple individuals of that species. They're not connected to any other bats, meaning they're not actually roosting in any clusters at all. How might they ever get infected? So the big question we're asking here is, how do solitary individuals or species get infected, and how do pathogens spread from group to group? Another way of putting that same question is, is how important are indirect or infrequent connections among individuals for the transmission of pathogens? So is there some way to characterize these social networks and the connections among them that captures both the social interactions and these infrequent or indirect connections that might occur that we normally just kind of miss? So that's what we did for this study. So, um, so we studied um, four species of bats in a bunch of different sites in both Michigan and Wisconsin where this disease had just invaded. And we went into these sites and characterized both the social um, uh, networks of these bats, which is what's shown in this graph here, which is to say, we basically characterized how many bats were there in each cluster, hybrid together, touching each other, and how many kind of connections were there among each one of those individuals. So that's what each one of these little clusters shows. And we also then wanted to say, okay, are there connections happening among these bats that we're not actually seeing? So we tried to figure out how can we figure that out. And it turned out we could use a kind of a relatively simple but neat little trick. So, um, so the first part I already talked about. The next part what we did is we said, could we somehow put a substance on some of these bats and see how that substance got to other bats? So it turns out there's a dust that's um, not visible to the naked eye, but under UV fluorescent light shows up quite bright. And so we actually took this dust and put this dust on individual bats of a few different species in each one of these sites. And that's what's shown in the picture down below there on the right. When the dust is really, really thick, it's a little bit visible. But once you kind of uh, wipe off most of it, it's not visible anymore except for under UV light. And we then asked, how does that dust get from bat to bat? So it um, turns out there's several different colors that you can uniquely identify with your eye of this dust. And so we put each color of dust on a single bat and then asked, where does that dust end up? So the concept of the, the um, analogy of that would be in this room, I might get blue, you might get red, and then we, after this lunch, pull out UV fluorescent light and shine each of us and say, hey, did you have interactions with me or with Peter or one of these other individuals? Where did that dust spread to? So that's what we do with the bats. Okay, we also measure the transmission of the fungus itself. So that's the spread of the, the dust and the spread of the fungus, and we want to try to compare those two as well. So here's a visual version of what I just said. This is a picture of a bat hibernating. That's its ears at the lower bottom there, and its wings are the kind of reddish kind of skin, and the very, very top are its feet clinging onto the wall. This is a bat that we dusted. This is by my headlamp, a kind of normal light. I don't see any dust. It just looks like a kind of a furry bat. If I turn off my headlamp and pull up my UV fluorescent bat, or sorry, light, that's what the bat looks like. So all those kind of bright white pictures in there are the UV fluorescent dust. So given those methods, we can then ask this question, which is, what are the social networks of these bats look like in these caves and mines when they're hibernating versus the actual connections among the bats via this, what that we can actually measure via this dust? So here's this thing that I've shown you now four or five times. On the left graph are each of these clusters of bats where they're hibernating together. And so you can see there's clusters of maybe 15 or 20 bats, sometimes one or two. And then you can say, okay, when we then map out on those clusters, how, where did dust go from bat to bat? The numbered symbols in that circular kind of network on the left, those are the dusted bats. So on the upper left, um, there's a number one. That bat got a single color of dust. It was actually found in a cluster by itself. It was touching no other bats. Did dust from that bat get to any other bat? You wouldn't think so. It's hibernating by itself, right? So here's the answer. So um, amazingly, bat number one, which was hibernating completely by itself, we put dust on that bat, and dust from that dusted bat, number one, ended up on all the bats that you see the lines touching that one bat. So somehow, even though that bat was by itself, it has these amazing, amazing connections to all these other bats in that same site. Does that make sense? So that's what's happening there. Bat number five is the same thing. Bat number five is in a cluster of, I think it looks like six bats. So you think, yeah, those other bats should get the, the dust, right? It did, but in addition to that, dust also ended up on a ton of other bats. So this is one site I've shown you data from so far. We went and did this at a bunch of different sites, eight different sites. And here's just a quick um, pictorial version of that. <laughs> what I basically want your eye to notice is on the left is basically the drawing of kind of the bats as they're sitting in these clusters. And on the right of those same sites are the connections from dusted bats to each of those other bats. Mm -hmm. So um, just for a quick example here, let's do uh, the one that says C and G. The left side there are all the kind of clusters. At that site, mostly bats are hanging out by themselves or in small groups. 
But then if you look at the dust of bats, there's all these connections among those bats, suggesting that the bats are somehow spreading this um, dust from bat to bat, even though they're not roosting together in groups. Okay, so yeah, actually, I already walked you through these examples. Great. So we can actually kind of quantify that and measure that in real numbers rather than just kind of pointing and arm waving and, and say, okay, what are these connections that we're observing in social groups versus the connections we've measured by this UV fluorescent dust? And there's a set of graphs here, I'm not going to kind of point out the details, but I simply want you to look at the far right, which is the connections we see, what fraction of the bats at a given site are you connected to when we measure it by the dust versus when we measure it by these social groups. So this um, graph here is showing data from a single species of bat called the little brown bat. And that species of bat, when you measure what fraction of the other bats of that species it's connected to by social groups, it's about 20%. So the, um, I don't have a laser pointer, but the little F that you see in there, in kind of the middle of the slide in light blue, if you go that to the left hand side, that hits about 20%. And that's to say that each bat at that site is on average in a social group, meaning in a cluster, with about a quarter of the other bats or a fifth of the bats at the site. However, uh, the other species is almost never in a, in a cluster or social group with other species, almost always just by its, in one species. So that's the kind of dark blue, red, and orange. However, we dust individuals of that species, dust from that species somehow is ending up on the other species. So the right hand kind of sets of four bars is what fraction of the bats of the other species is the dust ending up on. And if you look at either the dark blue, the red, or the orange, the dark blue and the red somehow are getting dust from this one species bat that they never socially, they never interact with socially, they're never roosting with. So that's the kind of uh, picture that we're starting to see here. So, um, yeah, so there's data for the other species as well. And I'll just say, yeah, let me say two things. One is, is that, um, let's go back to this graph here. So that's the general pattern with this one interesting exception. So, um, so the little brown bats, which is the data I showed you here in the same graph, they're uh, strongly connected to the individuals of their own species because they roost in clusters together. The dust from these bats ends up on two other species of bats, the dark blue and the red, and just for names in case that helps you, it's the big brown bat is the dark blue one, and the northern long bat that I mentioned before is the red one. However, there's a fourth species of bat that are called the tricolor bat, and this other bat, which also never roosts with the little brown bat, we never find the dust on it. So in the far right hand side, in the orange color there, that bar is really low across the entire graph. And that is to say that dust is, is going from this one species of bat to its own species, also to other species, but not to all species. Is that clear? So it's not that there's just mixing among all the bats everywhere. It's that there seems like there's these connections among some individuals and among some species, but not among all species. So there's interesting interactions occurring here that are basically mixing up these communities, but not in a kind of homogenous entire way. Okay. So, um, what should I say? Let's get that part. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, that's the connections that we're able to observe via this UV fluorescent dust that we use to kind of tell us something about the, the connections among these individuals. We can ask then, how does that compare to the fungus itself? So we don't actually care how this dust spreads. We really care how this fungus spreads that's killing the bats. So we went in and actually measured the transmission of the fungus as, as well. So on this graph here, on the x-axis, is time. It's basically the winter, as I mentioned before. The bats first get infected in fall. And they go back to hibernate, and then they die over the course of the winter as the fungus kind of goes from bat to bat, infects them, irritates them, wakes them up, and they starve to death by burning through their fat stores. So the x-axis is November to March of a given winter. The y-axis is the fraction of the bats that have the fungus on them. And so the name for this fungus is called Pseudogymnomascus destructans, which is a Latin name, of course, it's hard to say, so we often abbreviate it PD. <laughs> um, but basically, there are three different species of bats that I'm showing you data for here. The little brown bat is on the, the left. The northern long-eared bat is the one on the middle, and the tricolored bat is the one on the right. And as you can see, across each winter for each of these three species, the number, of, the fraction of the population that has the fungus is low at the beginning, and then increases as you go across uh, the winter time. But it's not the increase is not the same across all the different species, right? So the first two, it goes from zero or near zero up to near 100 percent pretty quickly. The third species is that antisocial one that also has no connections to other bats. Transmission is much much slower there. So that's the spread of the fungus. We can then map the spread of the fungus to the map to the spread of the dust, and ask, does the dust really tell us a lot about what's happening? So, um, so there's two graphs on this slide, and I want to say what's happening here. So the left graph is if we try to predict the spread of the fungus just with the social connections or the groups and clusters of the bats. And what your eye hopefully can see is that there's a little hint, hint of an increase in the data, but it's pretty messy, and we don't really get the picture right at all. And that is to say that the social groups, just the social groups, don't really give us a good accurate picture of what's actually happening. In contrast, the right graph uses actually the spread of the dust itself 
to predict the spread of the fungus that we observe later, and what you can hopefully see is that the pattern is much, much stronger. So in fact, when we include these connections among the bats that we don't observe by, via social groups, but we know are there from the dust, we actually can really, really accurately predict the spread of the fungus. So it suggests that the, these indirect and infrequent connections among the bats are really, really very important to the spread of the fungus. I will say, um, you might ask, how the heck is this dust getting around if they're not roosting together? And the answer is um, that uh, twofold. So the bats hibernate across for about five months long. They'll be completely kind of asleep or in hibernation, in torpor, we call it, um, for about two to three weeks at a time. They'll wake up for about one to two hours. Um, we know they'll sometimes drink. You know, they'll sometimes go to the bathroom, they'll sometimes actually have sex with other bats. And during this one to three hour period, they may be having connections or interactions with other bats that we don't normally see. So these, the spread of this <coughs> dust, we think, is actually happening both by them clustering with other bats, roosting together for three weeks straight, but also in these tiny, tiny short windows that are occurring in this, say, one hour block every three weeks. Does that make sense? So these are this, these infrequent connections I'm talking about. The second piece of the story is that because it's a disease spread by contact, a kind of a skin fungal disease, we think it's also the case that a bat could wake up, crawl across this part of the cave, go back to its cluster and go back to sleep, and then a week later, another bat wakes up, crawls across the same part of the cave, and picks up the fungus. So the two pieces of the story that we think are happening that are leading to the spread of the dust are infrequent connections, meaning these kind of passing things happening in a tiny fraction of your life, so just 0.1% of the time, and that's what I was saying before about the Starbucks barista, right? Most of your day is spent with your friends or your family or your colleagues, but you have these very short interactions for just a few minutes of time with individuals that you think you have no actual connection with, but that's a chance for that a pathogen to spread among individuals. In addition to that, we have indirect connections, which is that you never even saw the person, but for example, I met a few of you at lunch earlier today, some of you I didn't get a chance to meet, I wouldn't touch the doorknob over there. You may never even have one bit of conversation with me, and yet you then touched that doorknob afterwards, and that connection, therefore, between us, there was no real connection, but there's an indirect connection that occurred via, say, the surface of a doorknob, in this case, the surface of a cave or a mine where the bats crawl across, all that kind of stuff. And so what we're saying here is that this dust, we know, can be spread both by direct physical contact within social groups, also uh, by infrequent connections across social groups, and by these completely unobserved, in invisible connections via an indirect connection, say, via a surface of an environment. And that's how we think the dust is getting around. So I think that's actually most of what's on the slide. So the idea here is that these cryptic or indirect and infrequent connections create these bridges across social networks and individuals, and even across species. Now I should say, in case anyone's uh, familiar with this, West African Ebola outbreak two or three years ago, you guys probably will, hopefully all remember that from the news. A big question with Ebola is, is how the heck are people getting infected? So um, we have decent data that suggests that there's a number of species of fruit bats um, in West in Africa in general that carry the virus. But like people don't usually eat these fruit bats. So how are people actually getting it? So we don't exactly know, but the best evidence we have is traced back to the first case of that West African outbreak was a kid that hung out and played in this one tree where there was basically a cluster of bats used to roost there. So what I'm suggesting here is that the data that we've shown here is consistent with the same idea of no one ever touched those bats, no one ever ate one of those bats, but they shared space with, this kid shared space with these bats, where basically the shedding of that virus actually occurred. So, um, as we did this work on these hibernating bats, which of course is not necessarily that relevant to people, but you can take a step back and realize, oh, the exact same ecological processes that are occurring here apply also to humans, to lots of other animals, all that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of um, broader implications of this type of thing. So, um, what do I want to say besides that? I guess the other things I'll just say is that these cryptic connections that connect individuals across social groups are not just happening among all individuals. So it's true that it creates many connections that we don't otherwise observe, but there are still individuals either within a species or even whole species that don't seem to be connected. And that's almost by itself super, super interesting, right? So, um, so we have this one species of bat, of this four bat species community that I showed you here, that really weren't connected to any bats, neither social connections or through these indirect connections. And so you might ask, like, why is that? How are they pulling this off? And it seemed like, I didn't show you the data, so I didn't have time today, but they basically, um, they hang out in just tiny subsections of the cave where no other bats actually go. So it's not just that they don't cluster with them, they don't do that either, but they also kind of sequester themselves in space and time. And that helps them kind of avoid other connections with other bats. So, um, yeah, so the take-home message here of this section is that things aren't always what they seem. These hidden connections could create real problems, and that you should kind of be aware of the fact that even though you think you know the people you're connected to, 
you're also connected to a much broader network via these chance encounters and kind of indirect connections themselves. So um, in Santa Cruz, we don't use public transportation as much as we do in other places, but I lived in New York for five years, and if you live in New York, and you go to the office every day via the subway, you realize every single day I'm connected to to tens, hundreds, and possibly even thousands of people via the subway car that I'm sitting on, the turnstile that I push my hand through, all that kind of stuff. And those are those kind of connections I'm talking about here. Okay, so I'll finish up with just one more quick story, which is to say we can then ask the original question, which was, what will the long-term long -term impact of this disease on bats be? Um, I'll tell you that there was this interesting pattern that we noticed when this fungus first started spreading, which is that um, in North America, there, are, there were many mines and caves that had huge numbers of bats, and some species actually occurred in groups of like 200,000. So you could go into a mine in New York and Vermont and places like that and find 200,000 bats of a single species. Just these amazing, amazing, huge um, clusters of bats and colonies of bats, just like we have large human cities. In contrast, if you went into caves and mines in Europe, on average, cluster sizes were much, 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 much smaller. So people thought, huh, that's kind of weird and curious. And is it possible that where this fungus is, that's actually caused the bats in Europe to occur at smaller cluster sizes? So this is the kind of hypothesis that we wanted to look at. We can't go back in time and ask, when the fungus got to Europe, did it cause these cluster sizes to decrease? But we, what we can ask is say, hey, how is this fungus going to change North American colonies, and will it make them more like European bats? So the question here is basically to ask, the y-axis is the mean cluster size of bats in colonies in North America. That's what the graph shows there. And the average is somewhere, it's on a log scale, so I think it's around 60 or 80 bats per colony. In Europe, the average was somewhere around like 8 or 10. So it's basically a full tenfold lower colony size on average in Europe than it was in North America. And that's before White Nose got to a place. And the box that I haven't shown you today, which I'll show you on the next slide, is what do the colonies look like in North America after the fungus has got through the population, spread through and the populations have stabilized afterwards, where are they stabilizing? So another way of putting this question is, is white nose syndrome going to make North American bats more European? Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Knocking their, their population sizes. Okay. So, so that's the question we're addressing here. And the way we did this, as I mentioned a minute ago, is we actually got data of colony sizes of bats in North America before white nose got there, after white nose they declined a bit, and then stabilized and estimated those colony sizes. And here's the big take home. So the left graph here, left half of it, um, is North America. The first six bars are before white nose got to the place. The second six bars are after white nose got to the place. And the far right hand side is all Europe. And what I can hopefully see is that the first six bars, which are six species pre white nose, are all much higher than all the red ones. But then in the kind of middle six bars, they're all much, much lower. But in fact, now they're about the same size as they are in Europe. And so in fact, what we found is that the fungus has there, before white nose syndrome got to North America, the continental scale patterns of abundance of bats were super different between Europe and North America. After this fungus comes in, the entire continental differences in these colony sizes of bats has now basically equilibrated. And so this idea that the single species of fungus could come into a place and completely change the continental scale distributions of these bats and their abundances, totally kind of mind blowing to me. In addition to that, the small little puzzle that I mentioned to you kind of at the beginning of the talk, this, these graphs here show um, the colony sizes of bats, how big they were to start with, and then whether or not they went extinct. And basically what we found is that this fungus has actually caused complete extirpation of bats from many of these sites. So the site may have had a thousand bats, and now there's zero species, sorry, zero individuals of bats of that species at a site. And what I'm saying is, is that you could go into one of these caves and say, this cave looks great for that species of bat. Why is it not here? Right? These are the natural history mysteries I talked about at the beginning of the talk. And the answer is, it may reflect the fact that seven years ago, a fungus arrived at this site, and the conditions at that site were really good for that fungus growing there, and that wiped out that species of bat there, and it was the interaction between the fungus and the bat that caused that gap in the distribution of bats. Does that make sense? So that's the, the kind of, these mysteries that we sometimes see is that the absence of a species from a place may reflect the interaction of that, that species with some other species that occurred in the past that prevents that species from being there. Okay, yeah, so that's that take home there. So across the whole talk today, the things I want to take away are that these natural history mysteries, differences in either abundance, in this case, between bats in Europe and North America, or holes in these distributions, a species not being present in a place where you think it should be there, may reflect species interactions. It could be predation, it could be competition, or it could be disease. I've given you a disease example here today. Um, and then the second major part of the talk was how do diseases spread kind of beyond social groups, 
And the answer is that partly by social interactions that we have kind of frequently, but also by these indirect and infrequent connections. Thanks very much. Sure. So, um, so we've done a bunch of work now with the fungus um, in Europe and in Asia, yes. and it looks like the fungus still affects the bats there, but uh, does not cause huge okay. declines. What about Asia and what about Southeast Asia and Africa? Yeah. So, so a couple things. So the bats that get hardest by this fungus are primarily those bats that hibernate. So which, once it gets so warm that there's bugs all year round, I should have also said it earlier in the talk. The bats that are most affected by this disease are bats that eat insects, flying insects especially. Yes. And in the wintertime in New York, I don't know if you guys have spent much time there, but there are no bugs flying around in January in New York. It's simply too yeah. cold in the nighttime. But if you go to places where the nighttime is actually warm enough, you can still have flying insects. The bats don't actually hibernate. So in fact, in California, for example, yeah. most of the bats in California, especially the ones that aren't up in the mountains, they are active all year round because there's bugs all year round. So the bats in the tropics seem to be doing fine. Um, and, so that's that answer. Across Eurasia, they appear to be doing okay, although the fungus still be, appears to be causing minor impacts to populations. No and in South America and Australia, we have no idea. No idea. No idea. No idea. No idea. New Zealand? Yeah. No, we don't know. Yeah. Okay. Please, in the back. Yeah. 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 So those bats, they're hibernating in these caves and mines, and the interesting thing is that the caves and mines are below ground and so far below ground. But the temperatures there are generally about the yearly average. And so most of these sites, um, if you're right at the entrance, it'll fluctuate like the air temperature outside, so you'll go to minus 10 or minus 50 or whatever. But just 10 or 15 meters in will be on the order of like uh, 1 to 2 C to like 5 or 10 C. And the back space will use those kind of spaces. Yep, great. Please. Anything known about the mechanism of clustering? What induces the mass to cluster? My question really is how would that? Selection bring about the change in size of Absolutely. The sure. Yeah, so a couple uh, answers. Um, we know that uh, when bats are warming up during winter, so when they're hibernating, they hibernate for two or three weeks. They, they're we call them periods of torpor. They'll wake up for an hour or two and then they'll kind of hibernate again. We know that when they're warming up, if your neighbor is also warming up, it costs you less energy. So I should also have said that when they warm up, they take their body temperature from, let's say, 4C all the way up to 39 or 40C. That's a huge amount of energy to do so. They're basically yeah. shivering. So if you actually see them, they're literally sitting there shivering. And they do that for a few minutes until their body temperature comes up. If your neighbor is also shivering at the same time, it costs you much less energy. So we know that there's energetic benefits of clustering. That's, that's been kind of well worked out and done in the lab studies and things like that. Um, it also uh, makes you lose less water. So these bats, uh, their skin, as I showed you the pictures there, they lose um, water just via their skin. And if they're in clusters, they lose less water. So there appears to be some energy conservation benefits. Um, and some uh, water loss benefits from occurring in these clusters. So those are the reasons we think they form clusters in the first place, but, of course, as I've shown you here, there's some trade-offs to that, and there's some bad things that come with clustering as well. So we think that the clustering probably reflects some trade-offs and balances between those different factors. So they, the ones that are, if, they, the smaller cluster size, they don't need to be warmed up by their neighbors as much? Well, so I think the, the better way of putting it is that it's not that they don't need it, they pay an additional cost for not having their neighbors, but is that cost higher or lower than getting infected with the fungus in the first place? Yeah, and I think before the disease was there, being in big clusters might have been a great idea. Once the fungus is there, it's actually not such a good idea anymore. Um, and I think another way of looking at that is that traits of individuals or species that were very beneficial in one set of environments can become completely terrible in other sets of environments. In this case, after the introduction of a new species. Great question. Please. When, if you could eliminate the fungus, would you? Um, yes, and we've tried from local scales. Um, so many of the sites where the, these bats occur are old mines that are abandoned. They don't have kind of special unique organisms that live there. They're kind of just you know, tunnels in the ground with really nothing else happening there. And so um, we've gone in the summertime when there's no bats hibernating at all and used uh, in one case, we used a chemical that uh, Canada uses to clean its drinking water called chlorine dioxide to basically try to reduce the fungus that are on the walls of these sites. So when the bats come back in the fall, they'll have less fungus on them. Um, and that looks like it's been a little bit effective, but it turns out that the bats in the fall, they not only go to the site where they hibernate, but they also visit other sites to 
see other bats and also a mate, and they probably pick it up to those sites as well. So it looks like it reduces the fungus a bit, but not enough to fully eliminate. But great question. So if we could eliminate it from all of the US or all of North America, we would definitely like to do that, but uh, we don't have any way to do that on that large scale, and the bats and the fungus occur in caves and mines, and in many of those caves, there's a bunch of other organisms there that we wouldn't want to extract. Okay. Yeah, please. Going back to the beginning of your talk, what causes so few mis the lower mosquito population in California? Um, so, uh, let's see. If, so, if, if, if that was indeed true. Yeah, so I, well, it's just so that you can get your question exactly right. So, on, if you go to the, this graph here, so the mosquitoes uh, basically were moderately high before DDT. They crashed when we used DDT. They recovered afterwards, and then they declined afterwards. And what we think is going on um, is that many of the mosquitoes that were the most abundant mosquitoes um, didn't do super well with the land use change that we did. Um, and so uh, one of the kind of major take homes from this part of the talk was that, that temperature might matter, climate change might matter, but in this case DDT matters. In addition to DDT, when we change a landscape from what it was before, we put in, you know, farm fields and things like that, or cities, some mosquitoes that needed special kinds of larval habitat that don't occur in those habitats disappear as well. So several species that occur in California were knocked out in abundance when we limited the kind of habitat they used for their larvae. Yeah, great. Please. So if there's coyotes, you'll get less foxes, and foxes love to eat small rodents. 
So we have, uh, in this paper that I'm talking about, we have a ton of data across all these regions that show abundances of these different species of organisms. And basically, by getting rid of wolves because they are livestock, we basically enabled coyotes to rise to much, much higher abundances than they ever were. That has driven down fox abundance. And we know foxes are quite important predators of small mammals, which are the main reservoirs for lion disease. So it's a tiny speculative so we don't have the whole story yet. But these ecological connections that go three or four chains down may have given rise to um, higher numbers of rodents and rodents that live longer and that gives us more lion disease and things that, that feed on them. Uh, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, so there's lions also in California. Thankfully, so far, at much lower provinces than we have on the East Coast. Uh, but